That hymn, Show Us Christ, really sums up everything that we do here. This is about Christ Jesus the Lord. For without Him we can do nothing. And knowing Him is everything. I trust this morning that you have come to know the Lord Jesus. And as we study His Word together, that's really what we're doing. Now, James is the half-physical brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But more importantly, he was saved by that same brother with the recognition that there was something unique, something special, something glorious about his half-brother who is our Savior, who is our all in all. And James is a, is a man that his writing is so straightforward, let's put it that way, that it really somewhat affects our sensibilities, if we're prone to be a little bit sensitive. James and his writing is very practical, meaning he deals more with the explanation of living out our faith than with exploration of doctrine and theology, not that theology and doctrine is not present, but he makes it abundantly active, even with, I would call it, having legs on our theology. Although this was very likely the earliest writing in the New Testament, it was one of the last to be ex accepted as Scripture. And the reason for that is that some thought it denied grace. And it, it created a works salvation. Some still struggle with some of James's conclusions. We think of 2.17, faith without works is dead. What James does, though, is connect grace and faith with what, what it does practically in living it out. That's what he's doing. He's not denying grace at all. He's doing just the opposite. He's not denying faith. He's showing how faith actively is engaged and locked inseparably in our lives if we are in Christ Jesus. And so James' writing is a book to clean up, clear up the superficial. Now, I'm almost made an apology here as we start because What James is going to say is rather right up in our face. But you know, when the Word of God is described, what is it described as? Sharper than any two-edged sword. That gets up in your face, doesn't it? Dividing to the asunder of soul and spirit, gets him right down in the depth of our being, as to who we are and what we are and what we need. And nothing proclaims that like the Word of God does. It shoots straight with us. This is what we just said, the Word of God. Not the foolishness of man, but the Word of God that is able to save and ultimately, of course, that's the most important thing there is, is our salvation. So the passage that we're looking at today in uh, verses 26 and 27 is where we find ourselves after going through the others there, is really a summary of everything that he has talked about in bringing the difficulties of life practically into our faith, and living that out, trusting God and serving Him. 
And now he summarizes all of that, and it's about clearing up all the superficiality and surfacy junk that all of us have been engaged in or involved in to one degree or another. And we need that cleared up. So with that, would you bow with me as we commence to study verses 26 and 27 and ask, let me ask the Lord to help as we look at this together. Our Father, we come to you again with grateful hearts that we have your word. We know there's nothing like it. We know that it speaks and addresses things that we would not find anywhere else and that it is the most needful thing for us. For it gives us the truth, the truth that sets us free. It gives us the truth that is found in the object of this writing, Father, which is Jesus Christ, that we might have a right relation with Him. Father, that we might be saved, that we might be set apart, sanctified, and that ultimately we might live eternally with Thee. That is our hope. I pray Thee, Father, that You would guide my lips and help us, Father, to hear and help us during this time to make this useful. Help me to get it right, Father, and to explain it clearly. And if there's any offense, that it would not be with my foolishness, but it would be with your word, which can bring offense, but also knock down all the barriers and bring salvation. We beseech you, Father, for your work today, your Holy Spirit, to be active in our midst and to use this time to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in His holy name. Amen. Now, it's very common in our society, and indeed we talk a lot about the fact that things are politically correct in our society. Political correctness has always been around, and it really just deals with the whole issue of us trying to get along with one another and please one another. We don't want to be offensive to other people. And, and so we've, we've got this code that is sort of present all the time about here's things that you do and things you don't do, things you say and things you don't say. And one of the things that, that we, you know, people say, we don't, we don't ever want to talk about religion or politics, right? Because that's offensive. So we stay away from that stuff, and so we talk about the football game, or I don't know, uh, the weather. Uh, and of course, that takes about two minutes, and then we don't know what we're going to say next. But uh, the most important thing, even more so than politics, by the way, is the knowledge of this precious word, which brings salvation in Jesus Christ. And so the attitude with regard to, to this sort of generic thinking that is present is that if we are just sincere about what we believe, we're good people, then uh, it doesn't really matter what you believe or what you think. If you're sincere about it, you're going to be okay. That's the majority of the thinking today. Uh, that basically that Christianity can be defined by each person. The belief in sincerity alone leads to God. But, you know, the, the Bible speaks of a proverb, 14.12, that says there is a way that seems right to man, seems right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And our Lord Jesus Christ was very particular and very clear in Matthew chapter 7 when He talked to the religious people of His day and said there is a broad road. And there's many people on that broad road. And He wasn't talking about the road where people are out in the bar and bar hopping and, and, and drunk and, and committing all manner of debauchery out there. He was talking about the broad road even of religiosity. And But there is a narrow road 
the broad road leads to destruction, but the, there's a narrow road, and he said, few there be that find it, that leads to life. And may I just remind us, this sounds pretty silly, but it's real. God is God. It's not me to call the shots of what reality is. God is the one that must call those shots. He provides the writers of the Bible and the repeated warnings and examples and pictures and instruction. And we have that this morning presented by James practically, completely, and clearly. So that when we look at this, if we try to take on the mindset of the day and say, well, that's just your idea. Well, it's not my idea. This is James' idea, the inspired writer. James, who had was spoken of as having camel knees because he spent so much time in prayer. So either James is wrong, and that means the Word of God is wrong, or those pushing their existential dogma are wrong. And the, and the issue always comes to, where are you looking and what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the Word? Is that your source to evaluate yourself? Because that's what's needed here. Lord, help me to understand myself that in understanding I might have my confidence in Christ alone and find true salvation. Now beginning in verse 26, we have what I've outlined here are called the conclusive actions from regeneration, and this is sort of a summary. And he first of all addresses the inadequacy of mere religion in verse 26. And he begins with the supplanting evidence of the tongue, or our speech. What we say defines or tells us who we are. Now he uses, he says, if anyone thinks himself religious. And the idea there of this word religious in this context is someone that is really honoring God and acceptable to God. That's the idea of what he has. If you someone thinks they're religious, normally a word that we use in a derogatory manner, sort of an interchange with worship being only a ritual, someone going through the motions and ceremonies and often self-righteous sort of mentality with no real relationship to the true God. In Colossians 2.18, the same word is also translated worship, but it's the worship of angels where you can see that what Paul is talking about in that context is something that's not real. It's not genuine. It's something off, go off focus. It's an error. So James is condemning here about this religious business what the Old Testament also condemns. I want you to go back with me to the little book of Micah. The little book of Micah. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Micah 6. This problem has been present in the church or with God's people from the get-go. And here is what God requires of man, he says. Verse 6, here's the prophet speaking. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings with yearly calves? Now, God provided those things as a picture of, of bringing his son, who was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world not so that they would become the object of worship. Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And he goes on to say, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. 
You see, there's a huge difference between the externals and the internals, because that's what he's really dealing with here. The externals versus the internals, because true salvation is an inside-out job. Religion is an outside-only job. And do you know that religion is a curse? Religion is used of Satan. Satan would just love to have everybody religious, thinking they're okay, running around in their self-righteous attitude and self-righteousness, doing all manner of things, and going straight to hell. There's always a lot of religion happening in the world. When Cain was the first one, when he brought his sacrifice that wasn't pleasing to God. That was religion at its heart. We have today, in the name of religion, malicious killing of others. And we have religion in so-called Christianity. People, in the name of Christianity, seeking their own personal prominence and wealth and celebrity status and giving out their... as. Paul talks about in 2 Timothy their ear-tickling dogma to gain followers of themselves and not followers of Jesus Christ. And people naturally believe that being religious achieves a status of acceptability before God. Most people think that. I've had friends in the past, you know, they were out doing all manner of malfeasance uh, during the week, and so they say, well, you know, I need to go to church on Sunday to make up for it. I hope that's not your attitude. But we have that sort of mentality. We had the clear visual of this in Christ's day when he walked on the earth. Who was it? It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The very people that hung him on the cross. The very people that cried crucify him. The very people that could not identify him as the Lord. With all the prophecy of the Old Testament speaking of him, they still could not identify him. And they hated him. And that is why the difference between religion is seen again in Matthew 7 and verse 22 where our Lord Jesus says that many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and that in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never gnosko in the Greek you. I never had a real relationship with you. You were not one of mine. You who work, he goes on to say, you who, he actually says, you who practice lawlessness. You who practice lawlessness. Now that's where we are today in the study of James. There's, there's lawlessness here that is being practiced by individuals and it becomes very telling. This is the essence of what James is writing about is the difference between mere profession and what we practice in our lives. And the first thing he mentions here, you'll notice, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not bridle his tongue. Bridle is the word in the Greek, bit, as a bit in a horse's mouth. Controls the horse's actions. Now, I've been on a horse a few times, and I'm not a very horse savvy, but I do know this. If you don't put a bit and bridle on the horse and you start trying to ride it, you're in trouble. Unless you really have a great horse that's very well trained. Because that horse is going to go where you want, where he wants to go, not where you want to go. You have no control whatsoever. It's like getting in a car and you sit down to take off and guess what? There's no steering wheel. You're not going to get there if you don't have a steering wheel. Well, there are some supposedly inventing some things, but you know. Uh, would you look with me at a parallel passage over a few pages in 1st John in 1st John chapter 
3. John, just like James, and he gets really to the heart of the matter of our practice as who we are. Look at verse 6, 3, 6. No one who abides in him, that is in Christ, sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Now he defines what he means by sins when he uses the word practices in verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now, may I put it in a silly context where we talk about if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. That's what he's saying. Here is a person whose life is the practice of unrighteousness. Here is the person whose life is the practice of righteousness. This person is focused on the things of the world, evil things. This person's life is focused on the true and the living God, not just being religious on Sunday or some other time, but who, what we sang about today, show us Christ. And we are to be showing others Christ in our life. Now he uses, now well, let me go on to in this text here, he says, um, verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin. That is, he cannot practice sin. It doesn't mean he cannot sin. He's already dealt with that, by the way, in 1 John 1, 8, 9, 10. But he's saying that's not the, the tenor, that's not the general trend of the life. The general trend of the life is a new heart, a new a spirit that resides within them, and that's what he's talking about here. He says, because his seed abides in him, in verse 9, by this, notice this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, this is the righteousness of the Word of God, nor the one who does not love his brother, and he's going to move into love. Now, the point is, he starts off, back in James, with the tongue, what we say. Now, our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 15, 11, that it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. That's what the Pharisees were concerned about. But it's what comes out of the mouth, because what comes out of the mouth comes out of our heart. It comes out of who we are. It tells who we are. And that's what John is talking about. That's what James is talking about. They're talking about what defines you, what defines me. Are we defined as those that have a true relationship with Christ? Or is our affections really fitted on the other side of that? James would go on to say, as you know, when we get down to chapter 3 and verse 6, that the tongue is on fire from hell. And he's talking about the natural man. What comes out of man? You know, even if you listen to the modern or, or try to watch modern TV movies, it's just spewing out profanity after profanity. And it's just, I mean, it's just unbelievable all the junk coming out continually. And that's the course of natural man. But it goes beyond that into backstabbing and criticalness and, and anger and all manner of things that are against everybody and everything because it's a heart that needs to be changed so instead of an angry black dark heart angry against God angry against others angry about this and angry about that and upset about this and thinking they need this or they should have this and they don't and 
and all of this other kind of stuff. It's a heart that needs Jesus Christ. It's a heart of humility that we read about in Micah. Now, James back in our text says, if anyone... If anyone, if James is making the case that if a person cannot control their tongue, then there is no supernatural work of God in salvation. There's no indwelling of His Spirit that has occurred, that has changed that person, that has made a difference in their life. That's what he's saying, isn't he? It's just that simple. It don't matter how many religious certificates someone has. How many uh, PhDs or, or master's degrees or anything else they have with religion by it or something else? It doesn't matter how many books of the Bible they've memorized or anything else. If there is no changed heart, the tongue will not be controlled because the heart is out of control. Boy, it's amazing to me how clear. And... How accurate that is. How we ought to be able to see that. And he goes on to talk about the, the spacious nature of deception. What is it? So here's a person thinking they're okay when they're not. They're religious. But there's this but there. But deceives his own heart. Those buts are always important. What are they really? They're deceived. The self-deception. Describes a person thinking they're one thing when they're really something else. And their tongue gives them away. Now again, somebody's going to say, well now this kind of teaching is very judgmental. And we're not to judge. May I say to you very sweetly, I am not judging. James is. <laughs> and he's under inspiration. I'm not. I'm just up here preaching what he says. God is judging and revealing his judgment through James. And what he says is that he deceives his own heart. Well, is man's heart deceived concerning himself? Well, let's go back to Jeremiah 17, 9. You, you can turn there if you want. I don't need to. The heart is deceitful. Now, he's talking about the unsaved heart. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. He's talking about a sickness of sin. The infestation of being under the curse and being made in our father Adam's likeness. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? Only God can. And God is the one that defines that. Look with me back a few pages into 2 Timothy and the, the timely portion, that the last words of Paul about the generation in which we live. He's talking about, he starts off in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, we realize this in the last days, difficult times will come. And then he defines what he means by that. And when we get down to verse um, well, let me, let me find it here. In verse 5, holding to a form of godliness. That's religion. Although they have denied its power. He tells Timothy to avoid such men as these. A form of godliness, religious, but no power, no transformation. And when we get down... To verse 13, he says, But evil men and impostors, and that's what he's talking about, will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They're not only deceiving others, and they don't even know it, but they are deceived themselves. How do we know whether we're deceived or not? I have to come to the Word. That's why I wrote that book. I'll make an advertisement. Presumed faith out there. How do we know? It's not because I think I am. It's not because I'm the little choo-choo train that's trying to get up the hill. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No! It's God's Word. 
It is the two-edged sword that appear that pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It is giving me the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It exposes who I am. And that is what I need, right? And the Christian. And the Christian. Well, let's let's go there. Again, a parallel passage, first John chapter five, over a few pages. Is spoken of as somebody unique in the world. What does he say there? For whatever, 1 John 5, 4, is born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. How is it seen in our faith? We're living by faith and not by sight. Now what does he tell us there? He tells us that if we're born of God, and first of all, we must be born of God in order to be the other things we overcome. Now, he's not talking about perfection. And again, the context is not talking about perfectionism. That won't occur until God's people are in glory. But he is talking about a trend of life and the ability to overcome the world to not be so infatuated and saturated in wickedness and being drawn like a vacuum cleaner sucks an individual into all manner of things that are not pleasing to God, not His way of thinking. The overcomer overcomes that, and the only one that can overcome that is the one born of God. And He does so by faith. He lives by faith. And where is our faith anchored? It's in the Word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the Word of truth. And, he, and Christ says, sanctify them in truth. Set them apart to live out their faith in truth by the Word of God. That's why we teach the Word here. Because you don't need my ideas or because they'd be, they wouldn't be worth two cents. And frankly, we don't need your ideas either. What we need is God's idea. Right? I hope you fully and completely believe that. We need God's Word. But the Christian life is a life that overcomes. And that means back in our text in James that it's a life that overcomes this bridling or unbridling of the tongue. Does that mean that everything that a Christian says is absolutely perfect? We could make it inerrant and infallible like we do the Word of God? No. But again, that means the tenor of his life is not one of a, of a like James will later describe as a septic tank, but more of a blessing to others, a blessing to others. So this is a birth that overcomes. Now, when we get to verse, I'm going to skip over for now, this man's religion is worthless, and go on to verse 27, and we here we have the integration of profession with actions. And the first of the things that he gives us is found in love. Now he's defining again what is, he says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. That word pure, the Greek is katharos, means clean and clear. And undefiled is amenitas, which means unsoiled. So in other words, these are things that can be seen and measured. The idea is that no one observing with any uh, real view of what's going on should see hypocrisy. Now, even unrighteous people know hypocrisy when they see it. Every once in a while, one of these highly regarded religious characters will be caught in some house of ill repute or something else, and it'll come out on the, and they just have a field day with that on the TV set. You know that. Because what's identified as? Hypocrisy. You're saying or preaching one thing and doing another. 
But here James says, pure and undefiled religion. Pure here means external activities that are genuine and sincere. Again, I'm going to go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Notice again what he says in verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. Why? Because he's smarter than other people? No. Because he has made up his mind that he won't? No. Because his seed abides in him. The power, the effectual ability resides with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when one is born of God. And he says back in our text, in the sight of God, which addresses the special attention God pays to all that is actionable in our lives. That's why our Lord Jesus would say in Matthew 12, 36, that every careless word, and we're talking here about bridling the tongue, every careless word that men shall speak, he shall give an account of on the day of judgment. Now, let's get uh, a little bit uh, off track, but on track uh, for a moment. You know that Galatians 2.16 says that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. We can't work our way to, go to heaven. That would be pure, or really uh, defiled religion, not pure, unpure religion. That is what he's talking about here. So Galatians 2.16 says we're not, uh, we're not justified by works of the law. We're justified by Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it's interesting to go over to Ephesians. I'll get you to turn there. Ephesians. No, excuse me, Romans. You know, you always have to go to Romans. I'm not, I don't mean Ephesians. Romans chapter 2. Verses 5. Here he's talking about um, the, the problem with man and sin, and he says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves, yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. And by the way, that word there for deeds is ergon, which is the same word elsewhere translated works. He will render to each person according to his works, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Now, God's going to judge us according to our deeds. Now, we're not saved by our works, but we are going to be judged according to our works. Well, that's highly significant. That's why in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we are told by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are His creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so there is a interlocking, inseparable relationship between what we do and who we are. That's why He can judge us according to our works, is that it is the unquestionable evidence demonstrating the reality of our regeneration. Some people want to say that salvation is by grace through faith. And yes, it is. But that faith and grace are invisible. They are intangibles. And that is also true. But, not the evidence of their presence, that's not an intangible. 
Are you with me on that? Do you see that? If saving grace and faith are present, so will be the manifestation of a new life in Christ. That's just that simple. It's just that simple. James is showing how our actions define our personal reality. That salvation is not just being hollowly religious, but it is seen in life-changing substance. Now, he gives us some substantive things that have substance. He says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, which means that he's looking at this, that he's paying particular attention to this. And the first thing he says is to visit orphans and widows in their distress. It's interesting that that word distress is exactly the same word used for tribulation. The great tribulation found in Revelation. A time of terrible, incredible difficulty. So here is, he's saying, defining orphans and widows in their, their difficulties. Now, in that day, someone's husband died, they couldn't go down to the unemployment office and get unemployment, nor could they go get a job at, at uh, some business or something. Women didn't work, and women didn't have an income. Women were helpless in that day. And the same thing was true with orphans. And that's why he uses this here. These are in that environment in a terrible situation. And here was individuals that were to what? Show love to them. Show concern. Show compassion. Who does that more than anybody else? Our Lord does. And we're to be like Him. And He says, if you want to define what really needs to be, quote, true religion, it's being concerned about widows that are helpless and in tribulation and orphans that are in tribulation. Because there's nothing selfishly to be gained to help those who cannot help themselves. They can't repay you. They contribute nothing on the world's gauge of contribution. They're just, according to the world, sort of like in that movie Scrooge, they're just the, the riffraff out there that are you know, taking up space and breathing air. You see, this is God's kind of love then that he's talking about. Where God loved the unlovely. God loved the helpless. God gave his own son for the likes of you and me who were his enemies. And he didn't ask anything in return because we can't give him anything. Oh, we can commit our lives to him and we're supposed to. That's not what I mean. But we're really not contributing Him anything. If we're, if we're giving our lives to Him, what are we doing? We're only doing that which we should be doing anyway. We are His creation. We are His. We're not ours. When we look at professing churches and ministries, are they self-focused? A lot of them are. Or are they God-focused? Are they like Christ or more like the world? And that's what James is talking about here. We are to be communicating the love of Christ, what uh, Jose talked about this morning, which is very clear. We're to be showing people what Christ is all about. Now, the second thing he says is, the significance of purity, to be unstained, he says, by the world. To be unstained by the world. Unstained is aspilos, unspotted, unblemished. The idea is having the marks of the world on the person. Stained by connection to the world rather than to Christ. We are to live in the world but not be of the world. The world here is cosmos which is used in Scripture in a variety of ways, and that gets people tangled up. What does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world. 
which, which when you try to compare, and that's the word cosmos, when you try to compare that with 1 John 2.16, where we are commanded not to love the world or the things of the world, you say, well, wait a minute now. God loved the world, but I'm not supposed to love the world. We have to understand everything in the context in which it is given. In fact, go over to 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, where John commands, or really Christ through John, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot have a love affair with what he's defining here as the world, while at the same time have a love affair with Jesus Christ. That is not impo that is impossible. That's what he says, doesn't he? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he goes on to say, he explains it, for all that is in the world. Now he's talking about the unsaved, unregenerate, unrighteous world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. He's talking about the fallen world here, isn't he? He's, he's talking about that which is consumed under the curse with all manner of pride, selfishness, and evil. Everything that is contrary to God. Because the prince of the power of this world is Satan. And Satan is the deceiver. Satan is the liar. Satan is the enemy of God. And it all started in the garden, didn't it? As God said, you will not surely die. Have we been dying? Yes, we have and we are and we will. So the world here represents the sinful nature of men in its expression of harmony with all that is opposed to God and replaces God with consuming evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ talked about in Luke chapter 16 that we can't serve two masters. We can't serve God and the devil. We can't put one hand upon our Lord Jesus Christ who is pure and righteous and holy and another hand upon sin and evil and vileness and all that is wicked and opposed to God. At the same time, it's impossible. And so to be unstained is not to move out of the world, and some people have tried that in convents and so forth, not to go along with the world, but is to be in the world, but not of the world. It is to be lights in the world. It is to be the salt of the earth. It is to point people to the only hope there is, which is Jesus Christ, not to participate in the mindset and actions that are contrary to God. Now, there's a lot of people trying to do that. They're trying to please God and trying to please others at the same time, and you can't, you can't always do that, can you? And we have to be pleasing to God first. I hope you see how corrective this is in our thinking. And may I say to you that only those that are in Christ Jesus have the power to overcome that. I don't like being unpopular. I don't like being accused of being hard-headed and bull-headed and all this other stuff and a whole lot worse that I can't name. Jesus Christ said, if you are of the world, the world would love you, but you're not of the world, and therefore the world hates you because it hated me first. Do you realize that to live in this world as a Christian is not to be Mr. and Mrs. Popularity? That doesn't mean we go around trying to be unpopular. I don't like that. But it means my allegiance is to Him, to Him first and foremost, 
and always. Now in conclusion, what James has described is impossible outside the work of God. Our Lord told Nicodemus, remember that? Here's this religious man. He was a great teacher of Israel. And he comes to him by night before he can even ask the question. Christ answered the question. Nicodemus, your problem is you must be born again. Only by being born again can anyone begin to approach or, or do what James has defined here. We can't grit our teeth and say, well, I'm going to guard my lips. Now, if you're in Christ, you can guard your lips. He gives you the power. But you can't. If you're not in Christ, it won't do you any good. It's going to spew out. Now, that doesn't mean that your lips are going to be perfect again, even if you're in Christ. But what you should be doing is blessing others, not cursing others. In our text, back in verse 26 at the end there, he talks about this man's religion is worthless. Matayas, empty, profitless, vain. It has no value. None. No value at all. You, we often think, well, you know, so-and-so is a very religious person, so, you know, they're at least three-quarters of the way to glory. No, they're not. <laughs> worthless means worthless. <laughs> It has no value whatsoever. This is the same thing that Christ talked about in Matthew 23 when He pronounced all those woes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were the religious people of His day that were whitewashed sepulchers. They looked good on the outside, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones. Because Christianity is an inside-out job. You must be born again. And Christ said, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? They won't. In 1 Corinthians 13, you know what it says there. We can do all manner of great religious things, incredible things, but if we have not love, profits nothing. It's a zero. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about if the... If, uh, for the power of the resurrection of Christ is not real, if He isn't raised from the dead, which affects everything else, then we are of most people to be pitied. In other words, it's a big fat zero. Nothing matters. Nothing counts. That's why one must be born again. And so the question then comes to us, how do these issues raised by James overlay with our lives? If the tongue is not subdued, if the real love is not present, if sin is a continual indulgence in our life, really what defines us? The heart is yet unreached. The person has never been transformed. And you need to come to grips with that and come to Christ who is able to save to the uttermost. He very clearly says that all who seek Him will find Him. This is the most important matter of all time for every person. And for those of us that know Jesus Christ, but maybe we're veering around the path a little bit and our step is a little bit blurry and our confusion is... Uh, uh, seems to exist, and that's why we have to continually come back to the well of truth in the Word. Oh, I pray this clarifies what we're to be about by His power. And that is ultimately, as we sing, showing people Christ in our lives. Showing people Christ in our lives. God help us to be about it his business. Let me pray, please. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the clarity and the hope and the blessing that it brings, that it doesn't round off any corners, that it doesn't give us what we need to, or what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. 
Have mercy on us, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Guide us, O oh Father, in truth. May we be lights. May we be a blessing to one another and to others. And glorify Your name, Father, through us. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.